Uh, when I was working at Blizzard, I was introduced to this philosophy. Uh, the art directors and the director of the game would say things like, fail faster. And I think that this is a valuable philosophy, but it's also a dangerous philosophy. Yes, certainly you want to fail so that you can learn from your experiences, uh, but you also have to be cautious to not become addicted to failing <laughs> and become uh, sort of a, a victim mindset where you're always intentionally sabotaging what you're making so that you can get empathy. Empathy is not the goal. Uh, success is the goal. And so looking at your failures in a different perspective becomes an integral tool in your personal development and in your artistic growth and in your career growth as an artist and as, as I think as a human, I would say. So yes, we're going to play amateur psychologist for a little bit here today, but we're also mostly, this is just my experience that I'm sharing uh, with this because as I said, it's a, this is a very common thing that you'll hear around the offices at these big game studios. I don't know if they still say this, but it's something that was just constantly said to us, oh, just fail faster, fail faster. And the project reaps the rewards of those failed experiences, but sometimes the individual artists that were failing, uh, they have to deal with the baggage of feeling like a lot of their work is a failure. And then they begin to adopt that as an almost personal internal dialogue, especially if they're really invested and you're spending 12 hours a day at the office, which is something that I had to do back in the day. And this topic actually comes up because I got an interesting comment. And I want to talk about it because it discusses this, this concept and our perspective on uh, failure and projects not panning out the way that we had hoped. And maybe many of the people in the audience, people who tune into my channel might experience some of this. I know I certainly have at times, uh, specifically Ian Arias said that his game was funded and he put it together. They released a game and it didn't perform as well as he'd hoped. And, and, and it kind of got, I got the impression he was feeling a little, still a little burned by it and maybe even a little uh, gun shy about uh, stepping forward and, and taking another stab at it, taking another crack at it. First of all, if you get a chance to get somebody to invest money in your game, I mean, holy mackerel, and you actually finish that game and deliver it and it's available on stores, hey, that's a huge, huge uh, accomplishment just in and of itself. And two, you're gonna learn an awful lot of lessons from uh, doing something and releasing it. You know what, you, even if you just finish your comic book, even if you just finish your novel that you're writing, or even if you just finish, hell, even just that art book or, or that sequence of drawings that you're working on, whatever it is, even if it's just filling that sketchbook, you will have learned more than if you did not. Many artists don't even begin their projects because they're just intimidated or afraid of failure. Working hard on something and then face planting is a valuable lesson. That is a valuable treasure. In fact, the money isn't the reason to do the damn thing at all. <laughs> I mean, it's nice if you could keep paying your bills and certainly we all have to contend with, you know, uh, the, the challenges that come with just, you know, inflation and, and surviving and balancing our income with, you know, what we, what we want to be doing with what we need to be doing to stay afloat. And that, that in and of itself is a challenge enough, but to have actually done it and felt as though you've completed it. I mean, one, you got to flip the script on that, buddy. In, in one way or another, you got to see it the way that the outside world would see that. Like, holy crap, you did it. You were able to put together a team and you will have learned so many lessons about managing that team and about the, the challenges of, of even designing something that's interesting and fun to play. I mean, I've had my fair share of failures, as, as some people would call them. Um, my first indie solo indie game, I kind of set out knowing it would be a failure. And one of the reasons why I did it, even though I, I knew it wouldn't perform particularly well, one of the reasons I did it, it was just because I needed to have some kind of a greater understanding of how to develop my skill, of what makes a game fun to play, like what creates a polished game experience, what does the the end user experience. Now I had shipped several games for other companies as a concept artist, but I had never been tasked with creating a... Um, a sequence of rooms, for instance, that would be challenging and, and action-packed and have enemies in them and obstacles. Most of the stuff I've done in games is uh, art and story. I wrote a game once for Capcom and I did uh, concept art and world building stuff like backstory for some pretty big video games, you know, in, in the biz. And so for me, it's like, yeah, I kind of have those, that those skills are in the bag, but when it comes down to like level design or combat design, you know, creating interesting AI that's fun to interact with, 
But those were new, totally new experiences for me, new skills I had to develop when I decided that I wanted to go completely indie. The first time that I released a game on Steam, I was so baffled by their process of even getting a game approved. I didn't realize there was so much work has to go into the marketing materials and I just released it. I just hit upload, bam, it's, it's public. And then I went on Twitter and started <laughs> announcing it. Not the best way to do it. Some might categorize that as a failure. I failed at my launch of my first solo developed indie game. Mistakes were made, lessons were learned. Admittedly, it has over 200,000 downloads and a damn good overall review score, but financially by no means did it even break even. The, there's so many things to learn from releasing a game. Now I'm doing it a lot more carefully. I, I put together some scenes, some moments that show the fun gameplay and I put together a Steam page and I allowed people to wish list it. Yeah, I'm working on Twilight Monk, which is my second, well, I, I don't wanna say my second solo indie game, because now we actually have a publisher and I am working with a team of about four people. Uh, but it's the second game from my company, Aquatic Moon. And honestly, I don't think that I could have recruited talent to the project if I had not released that first solo dev game. And I don't think that I could have gotten publisher interest if I had not completely finished a solo developed indie game. If you've released a game, that shows a lot more commitment to finishing a project. And this is not exclusive to just indie game development. If you're making a comic and you really want to make comics, if you're making a novel and you really want to make novels, whatever it is, if you're making short films, like finish it, finish something small, small, finish a small thing. Regardless of the quality of it, investors or, or even uh, readers or players or viewers, they're more likely to jump on board with somebody who's actually completed some things and shows that commitment to completing things because there's probably lessons learned. Subconsciously, we all know this. You know, there are, 99% of the people out there that think they want to work in games will never actually make their own game with the resources they got. They got ideas on making an MMO or some massive game, but they don't want to stop and just make a simple 2D platformer or something that will get them their chops, their experience. So once you've shipped something, a lot of other indie developers can take you a lot more seriously. Even if your game had some flaws in it, other publishers can now look at you and go, oh, well, this is a person who will at least finish their product. And for publishers from their perspective, with game development anyway, they're taking the shotgun approach. They uh, they don't know what will make a game popular or not. It's, it's strange that like Vampire Savior is one of the top three games on Steam right now. It's a $3 game and it was just a it's a it's a crapshoot, man. I mean, it is a shotgun approach. It is a throw the dart at, at the board, throw 50 darts at the board, and one of them's going to hit. That's basically the way that publishers look at game publishing, especially in the indie game space right now. So they want to make sure that the dart has wings, that it'll at least hit something. If the game doesn't come out, they flush their money down the toilet. But if you can at least show that you finish games, well, then that's better than 95% of the people out there who say they just have an idea for a game. When you decide to go indie, you're gonna find a lot of people making a lot of promises and a lot of people who have no skills but a bunch of ideas, okay? They can't execute. And so somebody who's actually made something, th that really knocks them up a notch in terms of people wanting to work with you. Hell, even if an artist made a game using RPG Maker, I'd rather work with that person than somebody who just says, oh, I got a bunch of ideas for games. And the reason is because somebody who has not, has no idea what the road looks like. They just have the dream of what it must be like to get there. But once you've actually experienced it, you've experienced the struggles, your feedback suddenly becomes so much more valuable. Why? Because you've experienced failures and you pulled out a nosedives and you band-aided things together and you duct taped stuff together and you made it work and then you made a final product that you felt confident enough to actually release even if you got regrets you will always feel that everything that you ever make will be something you'll want to go back and fix or rework or remake because technology is always advancing your skills always advancing you're always seeing things through a new lens and there's always a way to improve upon your past self so do not be afraid of that embrace it lean into it almost wear it with pride the things that make your project flawed are probably things that make it more interesting
And it's also a bullet point list for you to evaluate in your more current self to look back on and go, oh, I can improve on the combat interaction. Oh, I can really, I should really spend a little bit more time on the animations or, oh, I should really improve this part of it. Whether, whatever your project is, you can create a bullet point list in your sort of post-mortem to evaluate your performance. How could I improve on that with the next one, with the next iteration? I do this with everything. I do this with my novels. I do this with my uh, art books. I do this with my art tutorials. I do this with my YouTube videos. Right now, you're watching it happen in real time. And this is why experience isn't just a checkbox on your resume. Experience is the value. That is the real reason to pursue something. The, the paycheck just needs to be enough for you to get by to get more experience because experience is knowledge. Knowledge is efficiency, it's competence, and competence almost always pays off, unless if you're overthinking. But once you've developed and established that you're somebody that will actually release and finish product, whatever it is, books, comics, games, whatever it is that you're pursuing. Once you've shown that you can complete a product, that means that you've gone through the trenches. You've experienced the struggles of getting 95% of the way and realizing you got to redo a whole sequence of your story, of your game, of whatever it is. That's That shows that you actually have the, the fortitude to complete and finish something. This is the value of experience and it is, it is the failures that teach us how to persevere. You will not learn unless you have struggled and unless you have failed a few times, you will not learn. And I say this with a bit of caution because failure, if you don't contextualize it correctly, can become your addiction. And then you almost become addicted to str struggling and then getting people to bail you out. You don't wanna go that route. Look at failure as something that you yourself get the advantage of learning from. Technically speaking, Every single effort you make is a failure. And you are just refining that process, that formula. You are refining that skill down to a perfectly functional masterpiece of a machine. You never quite arrive, but hopefully that machine will guide you closer and closer to your initially designed goal. So if you find that you're just treading water, if you find that you're just everything that you're doing, you've sent out your manuscript to 50 different um, agencies, you've got a hundred rejection letters, uh, every publisher in town is slapping you away, uh, you are getting zero sales and zero clicks on the things that you're doing with the artwork that you're posting. If you're finding that you're getting trapped in that cycle and it just feels like there's no breaking free of it, I think that's the moment. And here's the, here's the toolkit, here's the thing. Uh, that you need to do when you face that because I've been there with different things, okay? I do a lot of different stuff. Some things sell better than other things. And I always go back to get some little wins. And I've done some videos about this. Little wins are those moments from your art development or from the projects that you've made that did get some of what it is that you're after. So you might look through your old posts that you've made, like which ones grabbed a little bit more attention? Um, maybe do a little bit more of what worked from those things. Like see if you can dissect your own formula and, and kind of create your own path based on what you do well. You know, maybe you've got, uh, you had a couple of images that went viral, or maybe you had a couple of images that got more views or more likes or more engagement from people than what you usually get. Well, go back and maybe do a little bit more of that, or maybe consider that there are certain styles of comic book panels that you do better than others. Maybe do a little bit more of the things that you excel at, maybe certain artistic style you wanna do a little bit more of. When I'm talking about the little wins, it's the equivalent of like, you know, when you transfer to a new school and you got no friends or something, you call up an old buddy and it's like, yeah, familiarity, you know, something that I'm good at, something that so I'm, I want to engage with people that know me. I want to do something that I'm, I'm good at. Okay. If you have another skill, do that other skill that you're good at. Everybody's got something that they're good at. Lick your wounds, build up your confidence again, and then tackle another project that is something that is your ambition. So a good example of this is like after I released the Aikida game, uh, I was feeling pretty beat up from a lot of the reviews. I put so much work into it for such a long period of time. 
and I was like, oh man, I, I think I just need a break from programming. I need a break from indie game dev. And I, I went back to doing something that I was good at, something that did really well. I do art tutorials on YouTube. I do contract work for big AAA games. Not so much of that anymore, but uh, certain art styles that I do really well. I just, just painting instead of trying to be a programmer, you know, fall back on the, some of those things that you're really strong at so that you can build up that confidence again and the excitement to try to tackle a new challenge again. And when the time is right, you come back to it, you know? You don't have to, but don't don't throw in the towel because it was hard. I was just recently listening to an interview with uh, Hayao Miyazaki, the creator of Spirited Away, one of the most legendary living animators of our time. And when he was making My Neighbor Totoro, he had done a bunch of storyboards and created a, a script, a treatment, and he was pitching it around and not a single animation studio would give him a chance uh, from that story. My Neighbor Totoro, look it up. It's kind of a kid's movie, but it's kind of a legend in a uh, legendary film. It's like, uh, he was like the Walt Disney, he still is, like the Walt Disney of Japan. And uh, I hate to say that because I don't, actually don't, there's a lot about Walt Disney I don't like. Well, there's a lot about Miyazaki I don't like also. But the man is considered a legend in his field, uh, primarily because of the success of My Neighbor Totoro. It was like such an iconic film in Japan and even uh, carried over into multiple languages worldwide, actually. And so it really kind of established him, put him on the map. And I actually prefer Warriors of the Wind a little bit more, but uh, he's mostly known for My Neighbor Totoro. Though he's subsequently, after the, the success of that film, he's made a lot of other films such as Howl's Moving Castle, and uh, Porco Rosso <laughs> and uh, several other, just uh, um, Princess Mononoke and Spirited Away, some excellent films in their own right. What's fascinating about that story is that to this day, he still feels like he can never live up to the expectations that he created from My Neighbor Totoro. It became that important of an animated film to so many people in so many people's lives. And ironic that that film was rejected by several dozen studios. He said over 50 studios rejected his treatment for My Neighbor Totoro. And he, he just kept coming back and persevering and trying again, trying again and trying again, and maybe revising the script a bit and then trying again. And when you look at it from that perspective, it's like he could have just trashed his storyboards. He could have taken his script and just thrown it in, in a desk and then we would never have Spirited Away or Princess Mononoke or Howl's Moving Castle. We would never have so many of these other great animated films. I mean, I mean, I think that would be quite a tragedy if we didn't have those films. And so I wonder how many people out there that maybe even are listening to this, and they've got that story or that script or that thing that they're making, and maybe they've faced a lot of rejection. And, and I know that feeling. I mean, I've, I've written several novels and I'm still waiting to, for them to take off <laughs> the Twilight Monk novels. It's like, I'm not done yet. I still want to write more novels. And it's like, I wonder how many other people out there have that incredible story in their mind that they've been chipping away at for years. And maybe the rejection or the, the feeling of failure keeps you from making that next game, or it keeps you from writing that next book or or sending it out to more publishers or or just putting it out on on uh, indie platforms just getting it out there get it out there and learn from it and then make your next one you can always refine your your skill you can always refine your abilities the only thing that can stop you is you so don't listen to the haters. <laughs> All right, dudes, I want to thank you so much for stopping by. If you're just getting started on your art journey, don't forget to check out my free digital artist starter kit. And in there, you're going to learn the basics of Photoshop and some basic exercises to get you practicing the fundamentals. Most of you know this about me, but I got my start doing indie comics. And that means I learned to self-publish my own books. And I've, t I'm, I've put together this workshop called the Making Comics Workshop. And it basically encapsulates everything that you need to know to come up with an idea for a comic book all the way up until the final published printed copy that you can hold in your hands and sell on Amazon. I teach you everything I know about the self-publishing business in my Making Comics Workshop. Also useful if you want to write novels or make art books. And uh, for everybody else, dudes, I'm here every week. So don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell. And I will see you in the next video. All right, ciao.